Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the Basilicast Podcast, hosted at podfeed.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Sunday, June 18th, 2023, and this is show number 945. Well, Steve and I are actually in Houston right now to visit our son Kyle and his family, so this entire show was pre-recorded without the live audience before we left. You know how lonely I find that to be, but it's more fun to be with my grandchildren, so sorry about that. We'll see you next week in the live show. We start with another quick review of a gadget from Marty Sobo, and then I'll step in and explain how to make a virtual switch to control automations in HomeKit. George from Tulsa is back after a bit of a hiatus with a couple of products that make computing more accessible to him. Finally, in a rare appearance, Steve Sheridan joins me to explain why electric vehicles' range is so much more affected by things like wind and towing than gas cars are. Let's go ahead and get started with Marty Sobo. Hey y'all, Marty here. Today we're going to be talking about the Anchor 733 two-in-one wall charger. On the front, you have one USB-A and two USB-C ports. This also has a 10 milliamp battery built right into it. This is awesome because you can plug this thing in, plug your devices in, and you get all your devices all charged up, plus the battery inside gets fully charged up. You take this with you, and if you need to charge your devices throughout the day, then you have that built in. Also, this has a really cool flip wall plug built right into it. When you use it, you just flip the plug up and plug it in. And when you're done, you pull it out and flip the plug down and it just hides neatly right into the device. I would definitely recommend having USB-C to lightning, for example, if you have an iPhone, or being able to have any USB-C cables as that will charge in fast charge mode. So that's really cool to be able to have those options. The device is not that heavy. You can easily toss it in any go bag without issue. The average price for this device is around $100. But if you think about it, you're getting a wall charger, fast charging, as well as a battery all built into one device. So that's pretty cool. And that's the Anchor 733 two-in-one wall charger. Enjoy. Well, thanks, Marty. This looked like a really terrific device, so I took a deeper look at it, and I want to add a few more details for the Nocilla Castaways. The Anchor 733 can provide 65 watts of power, which is enough to charge a laptop, but the entire device provides 65 watts. That means if you want to charge a laptop, you can use just one USB-C port and nothing else while charging that laptop. As you add more devices, the 65 watts starts to get split up between the ports. For example, if you use one USB-C port and one USB-A port, the C port gets 45 watts and the A gets 20 watts. This is very common in this kind of charger, but I wanted you to know that it can charge a laptop when plugged into the wall if it has just one of the ports being used. When it's in battery mode and unplugged from the wall, the three USB ports all provide only 18 watts combined, which is too low for laptop charging. On the Amazon page I linked to, Anchor have a good graphic you can flip through that shows you just how much power you could get from the device, depending on which ports you're using and whether it's plugged into the wall. The other thing I wanted to mention is that there's a power button to wake up the charger, and it has four lights on it to indicate charge level. Marty mentioned that it wasn't very heavy, so I looked it up, and it's 11 ounces, or around 300 grams. Thanks so much for the review. This looks like a great device for the go bag. Like many Nocilla castaways, Steve and I use HomeKit to control our smart devices. While we can do a lot of what we want, it's often clumsy, and we get really tangled in the terminology. The solution to this problem is obvious. Add more automation. All right, let's set up the problem Steve and I were trying to solve, and as I explain how I solved it, I'll try to broaden the description to be more applicable to problems you may run into with HomeKit automation. At Casa Sheridan, we have a gas water heater, and the water is plumbed such that it takes forever for the hot water to get to the kitchen and our main bathroom. You may have heard that water is an extremely rare and precious resource in California, so running the water for, say, two minutes just to get it hot enough to take a shower is incredibly wasteful. In 2015, we installed a hot water recirculation pump. 
I wrote it up in an article called Saving Water in California with a Hot Water Recirculation Pump. The basic idea of the pump is that using sensors at the distant sinks, it senses when the water gets below a temperature threshold, and then it pumps water from the water heater into the hot water line. This solves the problem of wasting water, but it wastes electricity for this pump to constantly push hot water out to the sinks, say while we're sleeping or unlikely to require hot water. To solve the problem we created with the pump, Steve put it on a smart switch and only has the pump turn on during specific hours of the day. He has it set to go on in the morning where we're getting ready for the day, again during lunchtime for doing dishes, during dinner for the same reason, and finally at bedtime for our evening ablutions. This all works great, and I'll explain how it's done in a moment, but now to add the problem to be solved. When we go on vacation, Steve doesn't want to waste any electricity needlessly pumping water around the house when we're not even there. In HomeKit, he has to manually disable each of the automations for the morning, noon, evening, and nighttime settings. Yes, we're too lazy to toggle four switches in an app and toggle them back when we get home. We'd rather spend, say, four or five hours trying to make it be only one toggle switch. To bring this to a more generic problem description, if you have multiple automations in HomeKit that you'd like to disable with a single flip of a switch, this article might help. So to get us all on the same page, let's walk through the terminology HomeKit uses because it does get confusing. First, you've got devices. So this is switches, plugs, lights, garage door openers, motion sensors, and more, and devices can be named. Then you have scenes. Scenes are one or more devices in defined states. For example, a scene could be the garage door is closed, the living room light is on, and the switch controlling the ceiling fan is on. Scenes can also be named. Then we have events, and events are triggers for automation. The only type of events you get are time of day, an accessory is turned on or off, people arrive or leave, or a sensor detects something. So those are events. Finally, you've got automations. These are devices or scenes that are triggered by events, okay? So a device might be a light switch and the event could be somebody arrived home, the light switch turns on, that's an automation. All right, now that we've got our terminology down, let's talk about my specifics. We have a scene called WH on, which is simply the switch for the water heater pump is turned on, so WH on. We have a second scene called imaginatively, WH off, which turns the switch off so the pump does not run. Now remember, a scene is just a state for one or more devices. When Steve set up the four times a day we wanted the pump switch turned on, he used an automation. As I mentioned, automations are triggered by events, and the event he used was the time of day. While he could have created eight automations, four to turn the switch on at a specific time, and four to turn it off some number of hours later, there's an easier way. In automations, you can tell HomeKit to trigger at a time of day and to turn off after a specific number of hours or even minutes. He was able to have the water heater pump turn on and off four times with four automations instead of eight. Now, the problem with this flawless design is that when we go on vacation, Steve has to launch the Home app, tap on automations, and open each of the four time-based water heater pump automations one by one to disable them. It was tedious and annoying. I decided to figure out a way to make this a more automated process. I just assumed there was a way to do this in HomeKit, or in the worst possible case, I would have to go to shortcuts. I poked around in the Home app, and I couldn't find anything. And as usual, I failed to figure it out in shortcuts. To date, I have successfully made, I think it's one shortcut that I actually use. And I think I actually borrowed that from somebody on the internet. Anyway, the next obvious thing to do when you fail at something like this is to ask on social media. I posted in the Podfeed Slack and on Mastodon. I got several responses, all telling me it can't be done. When you hear can't be done and shortcuts in the same sentence, the only thing you can do now is to turn to Rosemary Orchard, who is an absolute wizard at shortcuts. I posted a question to her on Mastodon, and I asked, is there a way to create a shortcut to disable multiple automations at once in HomeKit? And she replied, it would be through using a dummy switch in HomeKit and converting those automations to shortcuts, which check that switch. Hmm. While the brevity of messages in Mastodon did not allow for a lot of detail, she did give me enough descriptive words to start Googling for what she meant. The words I started searching for were dummy switch and converting automations to shortcuts. 
A dummy switch is a physical switch that you will dedicate to the job of toggling all of the automations you want on and off. Now, if you're a semi-normal person, you should stop here and skip over the next part of what I'm going to explain. If you're a normal person, you wouldn't be here in the first place, right? But if you're semi-normal, what I've just said is enough. You should just buy a spare physical switch that's HomeKit compatible. Say like the Meros 2-Pack Smart Wi-Fi Plug Mini for 20 bucks. After you get it set up in HomeKit, you can name it something like Vacation. But if you're way past normal and you want to learn an even nerdier way to do it, it turns out you can create a virtual switch using HomeBridge. If you haven't heard of HomeBridge, it's a tool you install on any computer that's on all the time in your house. You can use anything from a Raspberry Pi to a Mac to a PC to a server like a Synology. HomeBridge allows you to install plugins that make non-HomeKit compatible devices show up in HomeKit. I already have HomeBridge running on my Synology that allows me to bring my Ring cameras into HomeKit, so I was up for this virtual switch fun. I launched HomeBridge from my web browser, did a plugin search for dummy switch, and found something called HomeBridge-Dummy, and it was a plugin with 2,000 downloads. There were other ones, but I like the 2,000 downloads uh, kind of number, where you think that's the, the main one. After I installed the plugin, I found a button that said to add an accessory. That sounded good. It let me name it, so I called it Vacation. And then I noticed a box that said Stateful. So I checked that box because that means the switch will remain on instead of being automatically turned off. I have no idea why you'd want a switch to automatically turn itself off, but if you're using this HomeBridge plugin, make sure you check that box for Stateful. Now, I wish these switches weren't called dummy switches, but I haven't been able to find a better term. My dummy switch happens to be a virtual switch, so I'll use that term for mine. As soon as I had my virtual switch in HomeBridge, it showed up in the Home app as a physical switch called Vacation. Okay, the nerd alert is over. Whether you have a physical switch dedicated to the vacation task or a virtual switch doing the job, we're ready for step two. Now, I originally assumed that the Shortcuts app would do this automation for us, but I looked up this convert to shortcut term and I found out it's a function buried inside the Home app. It's not available in Shortcuts. On iOS, because it doesn't work properly on the Mac version of Home, you'll, it's an option that you'll only see when you create a new automation. Now, you might think that convert to shortcut would be for existing automations, but you would be wrong. Now, I learned everything I know about convert to shortcut by a fantastic guy on YouTube named Shane Watley. In his video, HomeKit Automations Convert to Shortcut, he carefully and yet succinctly walks you through why you'd want to do this and demonstrates a few scenarios. He does a great job, and if this intrigues you, I highly recommend watching his video. I'm going to try to do the subject justice, but I don't think it'll come close to Shane's video because you can follow along and see exactly how he's doing it. All right, we're going to have to create our automations using this magical convert to shortcut concept. Remember, I've already created a scene called WH on, which is simply the switch for the water heater pump in the on state. Since I only have that one smart switch inside this scene, I really could have used the smart switch itself, but it turns out that having a scene makes it adaptable for future things to be added to the scene, and it also makes the shortcut more readable. So remember, I had four automations before. I'm going to have to recreate all four of them because you can't convert ones you already have. Now, in the end, I'll have eight, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. We'll create a new automation by clicking the plus button in the upper right in Home and choosing an event to trigger the automation. I'm using a time of day occurs as my event trigger. At this point, you're offered scenes and accessories to automate. Do not choose a scene or accessory to automate. Instead, scroll down to the very bottom of this list of scenes and accessories, and that's where you'll see the button that says convert to shortcut. I mean, totally intuitive. I can't believe you never noticed it or figured out what it did. Okay, you'll now enter the lovely world of shortcuts, but it's not exactly shortcuts. It appears to be a small subset of shortcuts, but it has the shortcuts we need. For us to have a single switch to flip that disables four automations, we need to create some logic. Now, it's common to create something like an if-then-else kind of condition in programming. Apple uses a slightly different terminology. They use if, otherwise, and if. Same thing. All right, we want to tell our shortcut that if the vacation switch is turned off, go ahead and run the automations to turn the water heater pump on. Otherwise, meaning vacation is on, then set the water heater pump to off. 
When Mini Shortcuts opens, you'll see it already has one command, set scenes and accessories. We'll be using it in a moment, but first we need to add the logic steps. Creating the logic is actually super easy. In the search bar at the bottom, just type if. And when the option shows up, double tap it and we'll drop in three commands, if, otherwise, and end if. Remember I said that the shortcut will be pre-populated with a single command to set, to set scenes and accessories? We want to move that down into the if conditional statement. We also need a second set command for the otherwise condition. So it's going to be if, do this to the scene or accessory, otherwise do this. You could search for set in the search bar to add a second set command, but Shane taught me a much easier way. If you tap on the little icon on the left of a command, you get a menu and duplicate is an option. Now you can drag the duplicate under the otherwise condition. Duplicating commands like this is a huge time saver, but make sure you duplicate the commands before you assign anything to them or you can only duplicate it with those changes already made. Rather than go through the details of how to edit the shortcut steps, which you can learn from people much more qualified than me, I put a screenshot in the show notes of my final shortcut that is very simple to read and does what I described. It simply says, if vacation is off, set WH on. Otherwise, set WH off, followed by that end if statement. Remember I said earlier that using a scene for the water heater pump switch was more readable than if I'd address the switch directly? In the screenshot, you can see the words set WH on, where WH on is the scene that I described. If I directly address the switch, it would have just shown the name of the switch. I'd have to tap into the switch name to find out which state I'd told it to be in, on or off. So if you name your scene with the state of the devices, it'll help you know which state you've described in that set step without having to dive down into it. Now, I mentioned earlier that I created four of these for the four times a day we want the water heater pump to turn on. But I also told you I had to make eight automations. I only had four before we started with this vacation nonsense, so why would that be? When we originally created our four time-based automations to control the water heater pump, we were able to not only turn the device on at a specific time, but also to turn it off after a specific lapse time. However, with Convert to Shortcut Automations, you don't get that option. So we had to create four regular automations to tell the four shortcut automations to stop. Since these four automations are all telling the switch for the water heater pump to turn off at a certain time, we don't need the vacation switch to also tell it to turn off because they're already turning off. So they don't need any shortcuts logic. They were very simple to create. Even though this creates a lot of automations, they're actually very clear and easy to understand at a glance when you see the list. Now, Steve was enamored enough with our vacation switch for the water heater pump that he applied what I'd learned to the water cooler. Think sparklets, but it's a different brand. The water cooler is also on a smart switch and goes on in the morning and off at night every day. A lot less complex, but yet another thing Steve has to disable manually when we go on vacation. In just a couple of minutes, he was able to recreate the automation to turn the water cooler on with logic from convert to shortcuts to let it happen only if the vacation switch was off. He's very happy now and was very excited to try the vacation switch on the two trips we have planned in the next couple of weeks. Now, I'm starting to think that my core competency, my niche in the tech world, is finding incredibly complicated ways to solve very silly little problems. While that's definitely true, I enjoyed the heck out of this whole process. I enjoyed learning how to make a virtual switch and how a dummy switch, if you forget the term, can allow you to control the super secret convert to shortcut menu. While a physical switch would be less nerd work and quite satisfying to push when you leave the home on vacation to trigger your automations, we can turn on vacation mode in our house remotely. And we saved about $10. Hi, I'm George from Tulsa, a longtime listener and once upon a time, a frequent contributor. As regular listeners know, Allison is an effective and passionate advocate for assistive technologies that enable those with visual, auditory, and physical challenges to enrich their lives through computing. She's also geek famous for her what's the problem to be solved question that brings focus to many tech issues. Here's my problem. After two eye surgeries, 
I find even normal light levels dazzling. The LED overheads in my office are painfully bright, inducing significant glare on my matte finish monitors. Add to that, my eyes haven't stabilized enough for my ophthalmologist to write a new lens prescription. Anything small is unreadable, helped somewhat, but not enough, by inexpensive drugstore reading glasses. I coped by turning down the brightness on my monitors and turning off the LED overheads. Working in Stygian darkness isn't a solution. Even with an LED backlit gaming rainbow keyboard, which had keycaps too small and dim for me, I couldn't see to type. I'm a good touch typist, but some keys, such as function, weren't taught in typing class, and I had to use a magnifying glass with built-in LED to find them. My daughter, who works with me, took pity. She found two products on Amazon that have greatly enhanced my life. First, Shade Magic Gray Magnetic Light Filtering Diffusers reduce the intensity of my office's overhead LEDs. Thanks to those, I'm able to turn the lights on and see what's on my desk. They're $22.99 for a pair that fit 2x4 ceiling fixtures. Amazon offers a wide variety of filter materials, including clouds, and seascapes if you want something more than effective but boring gray. Second, and delightfully, she found a brightly backlit full-size keyboard with large, well-spaced keys and big print keycaps. It has a 10-key number pad, worked plug-and-play on both my new Mac Mini M2 and Linux Mint system. I really like its keystroke action that has a bit of knuckle softening spring before hitting bottom. One other nice feature is very noticeable bumps on the F and J keys touch typists use to feel their hands are in the home position. I took pictures of the J key on my new keyboard and a well-used white Mac one. It was really difficult but not impossible to see the difference that's so easy to feel. But here's a hint. Clean your keyboards. The macro close-up of even my weak old new one wasn't pretty, and the old white Mac keyboard was just gross. I'm sparing Allison and her readers by not sending those pics for her show notes, but am sending one with both keyboards together to give an idea of the benefits of the larger, brightly lit keys. The Cop Jip Palm large print backlit keyboard is currently $28.99 on Amazon. Turns out there are a large variety of brands and models of large print keyboards. Who knew? This one's simple, works well, and makes me, well, happy. You'll find links to both the light diffusers and keyboard on Allison's show notes at podfeet.com. Hey, George, thanks for this. And it is so delightful to hear your voice again after all this time. That was fantastic. I'm really glad that you found a few solutions that help you out. It's also awesome that the keyboard was less than $30 and makes such a big difference for you. I do want to point out I feel your pain in trying to photograph the equipment we use every day. They do look positively disgusting up close. When I do use my own images, it takes me forever to get a non-revolting image and to clear enough stuff off my desk to make it not look awful. I don't do a great job of it, but like you say, just getting it not revolting is the goal. It was a very good choice to back up a bit to save us all from seeing the close-up. Have you noticed that it's been a really long time since we've had a new patron for the Podfeet podcast? I understand that money's been getting tighter just about everywhere, and if you're feeling the pinch, I don't want you to even think about donating to the show. But if you do have some spare change, I'd really appreciate it if you'd consider going to podfeet.com slash Patreon and finding an amount that shows the appreciation you have for what you learned here. I've asked Steve, also known as Steve the Husband, to come on to talk about a question I've had for a long time about electric vehicles. Welcome to the show, Steve. 
Well, thanks for having me on your show, Allison. It's a pleasure. Now, we've had this conversation a couple of times and you've done some research. And so I, I want to talk to the audience about this because it's a, I think it's an interesting thing to talk through. The mileage you get driving an electric vehicle is highly affected by things like whether you're driving into the wind, whether you're driving up a hill, or if you're towing something. But for some reason, gas-powered vehicles' mileage doesn't seem to be as affected by these environmentalist uh, sort of things environmentalists, but you know what I mean, things from the environment as much as uh, electric vehicles. And by the way, we're going to use a term, gas-powered vehicles are often called internal combustion engines or what electric vehicle people like to call ICE cars. So we'll probably yeah. say ICE more often than saying all those all those words. So the EVs are highly affected by these environment things and the ICE vehicles are not. And I want to understand why. That's a good question. And I had that one for a long time because it, it it just didn't make sense. And as I looked into it, the reason was very counterintuitive, and that is EVs are much more energy efficient than ICE vehicles, ICE cars. It doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> well, so because they're more efficient, then they are get worse because of the environmental factors. Yes. And and I know it's counterintuitive, but let me let me walk through this and please ask as I go. Interrupt me. So here, when we talk about energy efficiency. A car that has higher energy efficiency, what that means is a greater percentage of the energy stored in the car's power source, and for a gasoline car, that's the gas tank, and for uh, an EV, it's the battery. So a higher percentage of that car's power is converted to energy that actually makes the car move forward. Okay, so There's with an EV, a higher percentage of that stored energy actually goes towards go forward than with, mm -hmm. a, with a gas car. Right, right. And uh, and that's important because the thing, the environmental factors that you spoke of, whether it's wind or driving uphill or towing, those affect the driving force, the back force on the car, the resistance on the car. And what and the efficiencies we're talking about are countering those forces. They're making the car move against those forces. So what, it still doesn't quite make sense, I understand, but I'm I'm trying to kind of set the Build stage up to here. It. Okay. Yeah. So um, we'll, in the blog post, we'll have some uh, pictures that really illustrate this, but we'll try to describe it here in words. This is from a Motor Trend article that you found that, that does describe what's going on. Yeah, and, and does a, a really good job at it. With the so, graphics in particular. <laughs> yeah. P pictures to, are worth a thousand words here. So... Um, let's talk about an ICE vehicle first. And what's amazing, uh, what I learned from this article is how much of the energy in the gas tank is lost when uh, an ICE car uh, goes through the combustion process and propels the car forward. Um, when you look at all the different ways energy is lost, and by the way, energy is typically lost in these cars, whether it's an EV or an ICE car in the form of heat. That's not the only form, but that's the primary form of energy lost. It's just wasted, and that energy lost has nothing to do with propelling the car forward. It's independent of how much force the car feels and how hard you have to push the car forward. It's lost in any case. So An let, me, let me give a good example of uh, where heat is lost. If you can find mm -hmm. a uh, a traditional incandescent light bulb do you remember trying to change a light bulb exactly how hot that was when you went yeah. to change it? That was because they just lost most of their energy to heat instead of to giving off light. The same thing right. if you've got an LED light bulb now, you can actually grab those when they're when they're lit up because they're they're not going to burn you because they aren't losing all that energy to heat. So that's why right. they're so much better for the environment is because they're losing less energy to heat. So you're saying a, right. a gas car versus an EV. Now we're going to talk about how much is lost due to heat. Right, right. It, mostly heat, not all, but mostly heat. So in a gas car, let's talk about the total energy stored in the gas tank. Let's just call that 100%, regardless of what it is. It's okay. full, it's 100%. When you go forward and you burn that gasoline in the in the uh, engine, 80% of the of that energy is lost in the form of heat and other and other things that are wasted. 80%. 80%. And this is an average number, and it varies depending on a lot of things. But the article does a pretty good job of showing the ranges, and the ranges are between 75 and 84%. So I'm just going to average around 80% 
for an ICE combustion vehicle. So you put a gallon of gas in the car, only 20% of that is propelling the car forward. The rest of it's exactly. just other losses. Wow. Yeah, and, and okay. they describe the losses. Most of them are engine losses. There are some parasitic losses, drivetrain losses, auxiliary electric uh, electricity use, but all of those add up to about 80% of loss that is not propelling the car forward. Now, you contrast that with an ICE vehicle where no, you with start an EV, with, a, with an EV. I'm sorry. Mean? Thank you. You can you contrast the ICE vehicle with a, an EV, electric vehicle. You start with 100%, and only about 10% of that total energy is lost in the form of drivetrain and power Wait, steering. I'm going to correct you. 10% is charging loss. You, overall, you lose between 31 and 35%, according to the graphic you, you posted. Um, you're, you're looking in the uh, not quite the right spot because what the look down below and the thing that that 31 to 35 percent doesn't show is the regenerative braking oh. effects that add back that, that remove some of those losses and put it back into the power available to drive the car forward. When you account for the regenerative braking positive effects, you're only losing about 10 percent of that in total energy because you're regaining some of it back. Oh my god. You're gosh. right about I'm I'm glad I read this wrong because if you if you pay attention to the uh uh left side it says 10% charging loss, 18% drivetrain, you've lost 31 to 35%, but 22% is is regained by when you slow down the the energy going back into the into the battery through the regenerative braking system. So you right. get down to so you're only losing 10% yeah, and again, this is very dependent on the driving conditions. Uh, for instance, a trip on the highway doesn't use as much regenerative braking, but a trip around town in the city does. So, so again, this is an average, and I think the the numbers, the range they give is still pretty low uh, or narrow. Only about eighty-seven to ninety-one. I shouldn't say only. <laughs> a total of eighty-seven to ninety-one percent of that energy is used, meaning only about thirteen to nine percent is wasted, and we'll call it an average of ten. So, so on the ICE vehicle, we're only using 20% to propel the car forward, 20% efficiency. Right. And on the uh, EV, it's 90% efficient. Right, right. That's, that's pretty dramatic. It's, it's, it's a factor of eight, 10% 10, 10 <laughs> to 80%, right? Right, so right. Why is this important, though? Why does an EV take a, a larger hit? Well, the reason is... By, by you mean hit, from I mean, the environmental stuff? from the environmental impacts on mileage. And, and the reason is those environmental effects only impact the, the fuel that is used towards propelling the car forward. All of those wasted uh, factors, which is 80% for the ICE vehicle and 10% for the EV, those wasted factors are not affected by the environmental Because they're already gone. They're, they're gone. They're just not they're in the equation. They're independent of the environmental conditions. They happen one way or the other. It's only the forces that push back on the car as it's being propelled forward by its energy source that is affected. So that's that's 90% of the energy of an EV is affected by those forces. And only 20% of that energy of an ICE car is affected by those forces. So, so let me the see ICE if, car doesn't feel it as much. It's wasting so much. It's got a lot to give. <laughs> it's like right, you've got to, a leak in away. the gas tank for 80% of it to start with. And it's right. only f affecting that last 20%. Right. But, but what you see as a consumer when you're burning fuel is the 100%. It, whether it's wasted or it's going to propel the car forward, you're only – you see the – and so with an ICE vehicle, 20% is impacted. But when you group it with the 80%, that's not very much because so the 80% is not impacted. The amount of um, – drag, let's say, on a vehicle because you're you're going into the wind. Let's assume we got two vehicles of the exact same form factor. One is a, an ICE vehicle and one is an EV. The mm -hmm. amount of drag pushing back on the car, keeping it from going forward, is exactly the same, but it's only mm -hmm. affecting 20% of the fuel in the ICE vehicle, and it's affecting 90% of the fuel, if you will, in an EV. Right. So f because an EV is so much more efficient, it takes a bigger hit when it comes to those forces pushing back on the car. It takes a bigger hit from the total energy storage that it has to provide, a 90% hit versus a 20% hit on the ICE vehicle. 
And that's because it's so much more, the EV is so much more efficient. It just converts much more of the energy. And if you think about it, it's strange. That means 80% of that gas tank is just not never used to move the car forward, even though it it's necessary for as part of the combustion process, it's got to occur, but it doesn't really go towards something useful. It goes, it goes towards heating that engine block up, and you know how hot those can get. You know, that's well, it's so it's also food. busy, you know, putting uh, pollutants into the air, you know, helping <laughs> ca- cause climate change. It's got a lot of work it's doing with that that extra. Yeah, energy. there is there are some other things. Yeah, it's working towards, but uh, <laughs> the one you see most is is uh, the heat. I would say, as a normal consumer. As a loss, yeah. So the effect of this is that when you drive an EV, in in some ways, it behooves you to be more intentional and to pay attention to things. For example, um, Steve, when we're driving on a long road trip, you like to get that road trip done over with as quickly as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time. (laughs) I mean, especially on a long, boring road, uh, we go up to Fresno to see Steve's parents. There can't be a more boring road than to go up there. But uh, so you like to drive pretty quickly to get things done. But you've actually started to change your driving habits based on what you're seeing in our cars, in our EVs. Right, right. Now that we both own and drive EVs, it has, uh, I have modified my driving and that's because I do want to get a little more efficiency and range out of our uh, charge of the battery. And one of the best ways to do that as a driver is to not drive as fast, especially on the highway. And the reason is um, the force or drag that you that your car experiences when you um, speed up goes as the velocity squared. So as you increase your speed, the drag is going up much quicker. It's it's a square of the speed. Okay. So the uh, and what that means is um, increasing your speed, or let's say, yeah, increasing it say from fifty five to sixty. That'll have an impact on your range, but increasing it from seventy five to eighty will have a much larger impact. Those five mile an hour extra five extra miles per hour will impact your range much more significantly because of this squared law. Okay. So what does that mean? Stay away from the higher speeds. So, you know, I used to drive in the, I'll say, pushing 80 for mm-hmm. much of that straight long trip up the I-5. And that's that's a killer for an EV with that huge drag because uh, it's so efficient and it's hitting the mileage much more. So I've knocked that down 10 miles an hour, roughly, 5 yeah. to 10. It, now, it's interesting that you've done that. And I don't want to talk you out of that because we're also safer if you're driving uh, more slowly. Mm-hmm. Um but we don't have any trouble getting to Fresno on uh, the way we charge. We we leave our our house at, say, 10 in the morning. We like to stop after a couple hours. We'll eat a sandwich in the car. And the time we take to eat a sandwich more than gets us to Fresno with, uh, you know, maybe 20 minutes. We basically yeah. can't eat and hit the uh, the restroom in the time that we've gained more than enough mileage to keep going. Right. It's, it's it just feels matter. wasteful, right? It feel I yeah I noticed the waste I I guess is the way to put it and I'm more conscious of it and it has you know maybe subconsciously maybe consciously affected my driving habits. Yeah, that's um, not the but worst you're thing. right. It's no problem for us with a stop, which we'd make anyway, going up to Fresno to to recharge. And yeah, we, usually that stop is uh, we need longer to eat than we need to uh, to uh, charge our car. Yeah, and that's not even waiting for somebody to make us lunch. We pack a lunch because it's right. easier and faster. Um, right. So the other thing that I like about the uh, Tesla, and it, it doesn't really, it's just for fun. It's just for uh, education. You can watch your energy chart. So there's a there's a graph you can pull up where you can see whether what your average range is going to be, and you can see how it's affected. So we go over a hill called the Grapevine, and uh, when you go over the Pretty Grapevine, significant. Hill. <laughs> yeah. How, how high is that? I think it, it 5, peaks 000? around 4,500 4, feet, maybe. Yeah. So when we go over that, you can see our, our, our basically, we're, get, we're only going to be able to go like another eight miles. I mean, it just drops like a stone. And then when you start going down, it's like, yeah, you can go a thousand miles now because we're going downhill yeah. and it's regenerative braking is kicking in at some times. And you should basically, you can go forever if you're coasting down a hill. Uh, yeah, but that graph it's is pretty to see good. It. And and it does, you know, it does more than just show your instantaneous mileage, which will vary greatly depending on the conditions. But it, it also projects forward. If you were to maintain your your driving habits as you've been doing, it'll it'll project 
how far you will get it, it, with a much better estimate than uh, just the actual number next to the odometer does. Right, right. Well, every every odometer is a lie. Uh, EVs maybe a lie more than ever, more than any. But uh, so we've talked about uh, the drag from uh, from wind, wind. Uh, towing. Same kind of thing. No. Um, well, same kind of thing. It, it is true that you know an EV is going to take a bigger hit than a nice vehicle with towing, but I, I don't see an easy way around that one. Uh, there, I don't know of it other than also <laughs> reducing your speed. But for a given speed, you're going to tow or you're not going to tow, and the weight of that, uh, whatever you're towing, is a, obviously a large factor. Um, but again, it's, it's just, because it's af- affecting 80% of your tank, if you will, instead of ten, 90%, uh, 90% of your tank instead of 20% of your tank. For an EV, yeah. And so in, in actuality, an EV is not the best vehicle to use to tow large packages with. Well, I tell it's, you what, if you're towing a boat, don't fill the gas tanks on the boat before you start towing it. <laughs> fill them yeah. at the other end because you're towing all that weight, right? <laughs> yeah, reduce the weight. I don't know how much that matters on a boat, but... In right. any case, it's it's something you do want to minimize weight if you can. Um, and, and some people just, you know, they've towed successfully with EVs, but you have to more carefully plan your charging route. If, intentional, if you, just being intentional and paying attention. Yes. Right? You, you yes. can't just go, okay, I know I've got a 300, my car's so, supposed to go 310 miles. What's not going to go 310 miles if it was towing something or if I was into a, a tough head wound all the way? No doubt, yeah. Because towing, you've got a couple hits, you've got the weight, uh, more more weight and drag, and you also have more air resistance behind the car, pushing, right. having to push wind. So the drag's even worse. So yeah. we've talked about those factors, but what about cold temperatures? I hear about cold temperatures a lot with electric yeah. vehicles being a problem. Yeah, so that's a little different than the factors we're talking about here because um, these other factors affect both EVs and, and ICE vehicles. They just affect EVs more. It's kind of an efficiency impact. The cold doesn't really affect ICE vehicles at all. And it does affect electric vehicles because um, batteries do not operate well or as well at cold temperatures. Now, Tesla has done a a good job at uh, conditioning their batteries and providing thermal management of the batteries, probably the best in class of all the EVs out there, at least from what I've read and heard. Uh, so they they can help minimize that impact, but there are definitely impacts even with Tesla's thermal management to range with uh, that you can achieve with the battery and cold temperature. So the problem is that uh, battery chemistry slows down as the temperature goes down. You can actually get it cold enough that it does a battery won't work at all. The battery mm-hmm. in your cell phone won't work at all if it gets cold enough. It's just mm-hmm. the chemistry works that way. The the molecules stop bouncing around, right? So yeah. when you say they do thermal management or conditioning, what do you mean that Tesla does to that battery? This well, is on your way to a charger, correct? It, both on your way to a charger and um and while you're charging. And by the way, this conditioning it generally, you know, when it's hot out would be to cool the battery, literally cool it. Oh, okay. And they also heat the battery if it's too cool. So they actually put the, try to put the, the, the system tries to put the battery in a range that it likes to operate in, a temperature range. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of grinning right now because I'm realizing there's conditions under which the battery is too cold because the car is not generating much heat. Right, because mm-hmm. there's not much loss, mm-hmm. so it's not right. it's not there's not a nice hot engine block to heat up your battery. You, you it's actually going to get cold under cold temperatures. Right, right. So Tesla does as good of a job as they can to condition that, get it right at the right temperature. By the way, doing that costs energy, right? Yeah, because so you got to not you're only is the spitting heat out, right, or maybe cooling. You know, I have to think. I have to go back and check where they actually cool can cool the battery, but at least they, heard they can that, blow but... air on it. I don't know if they have any other active cooling systems. They so may the... have a liquid cooling system. Okay, so uh, it's, it's fact, self-contained. I think, yeah, I think they do, but I'm not positive on that. Uh, I do believe, though, that they handle both the high and the low temperature conditions and try to bring it to the, the preferred range. And so you're taking a hit by having to power the thermal management system, whether it's heating or cooling, and you're taking a hit because the battery's not in its nice range. I mean, the, the Tesla system can try to push it as best they can to the 
proper range, but often it's not achieved. By range, you, know, you mean perfectly. temperature temperature range. Right. And if it's outside of that range or at the edge, it's still not going to perform as well as if it's optimally at the optimal temperature. One of the ways we see this uh, conditioning is in the uh, Tesla app on the you know, navigation, you tell it, okay, I want to charge at this charging station. Or you tell it your destination, it says, hey, if you stop for 10 minutes at this one and 10 minutes at that one, you'll get there with plenty of charge. And when you say, okay, that's what I'm going to do, it then knows, okay, at, at this distance, I'm going to need to have the battery ready to charge and you can, it'll actually start conditioning the battery. Get a little notification says I'm conditioning the battery mm -hmm. now. So and you can hear that often um whether it's probably a heat pump or some some sort of fan kicking in that it's harder to hear when you're actually driving but when you come to a stop and you're pulling in or going slowly approaching the supercharger you can definitely hear that system. yeah yeah i don't want this to be all a, a tesla ad but um at, at risk of doing that, Tesla has done a lot of things to make the batteries more efficient and make this charging more efficient, as he's talking about. And uh, the result is that when you look at the distance per kilowatt, kilowatt hour? Kilowatt hour. Kilowatt hour. I can never get this straight. If you look at the distance a, a Tesla can go per kilowatt hour of battery, it's much higher than a lot of the other uh, EVs. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Y that's right. And, and a lot of that is in their motor design. Uh, oh. uh, probably a combination of the battery, uh, thermal management, and the motors being very efficient. Right, combination. Right. It's the entire drivetrain, power and drivetrain combo that, that's, that's well integrated, designed and integrated. Uh, my hope is that as the other manufacturers get better at doing this and get more time under the belts to catch up to Tesla, that they'll be able to be more efficient too. The mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm a big I'm super happy that Ford has come out with the Ford Lightning. Uh, Chris Ashley and his Ford Lightning. We love his car. Really, really cool that that exists. But his his vehicle is much much heavier than ours. Significantly heavier sure. than ours. But he has a, a a battery that's twice the size of ours with the same mileage. And that isn't all taken into account with just the weight of that vehicle. It is not as efficient, right? Right, because you'd think, I don't know if this this actually works mathematically, but you'd think that with a uh, needing a battery twice as heavy to get the same range might equate to maybe the weight of the vehicle being twice as much, but, but I it's don't not. think it is. No, it's it wasn't when it's we maybe first It's maybe 50% it. more. And you said twice the weight of the battery, you meant twice the capacity of the battery. In that, I'm sorry, yeah. twice the capacity of the battery, right? Yeah. So I, I just, I, I'm not, a, well, I'm probably a bit of a Tesla fan girl, but I, I really want electric vehicles to be everywhere, all cars, electric vehicles. I want all these gas cars to get off the road and let's fix the environment, do what we can to fix the environment. So I really do, I'm sincere when I say I hope that they catch up and pass Tesla and, yeah. and give, yeah. give Tesla, I mean, do better than Tesla at what they're doing yeah. to increase efficiencies. But and, and I don't want this to come off as as a negative to EVs, the fact that so much is lost uh, in, in terms of energy due to environmental effects, because EV drivers just kind of learn how to work around this. It's really not a big deal to us, but I think it is to novices or people who aren't don't drive an EV or aren't used to driving an EV. These kind of sound scary. And it's not like a headwind's going to be make it cut in half. No, or or no. or going from uh, seventy five to eighty five miles an hour is going to cut it in half. It just cuts it down some, but it's it's yeah. something you do you do notice it. It's, notice it's noticeable, it and, but and not huge. Right, and you learn to work around it. Whether that be you make sure you you uh, are tracking your energy use, or you've planned out your route so you know how far you can get to the next stop. All those things almost become second nature after uh, after a little while. Yeah, um, Rod Simmons. And Tesla has a Tesla okay. has a great app for. I mean, their their in car system is very good about uh, if you if you've navigated to a destination, showing you the the route, the optimal route, and showing you where and how often you should charge. Which may not be sitting at one place for the, a long period. It may be Usually a couple small stops because it's yeah. more efficient that way to charge. 
Rather yeah, than we've one, talked about that sitting. before, but we'll say it again. The the charge curve is is pretty much linear. You know, you sit there waiting for X length of time, you'll you'll gain Y amount of of charge. But when you get up to about 65, 70%, all batteries, your cell phone, any battery like that, it's going to roll off and take longer and longer and longer to get that last 30% uh, charge. Mm -hmm. So when you when you do navigate with the Tesla app, it'll say stop here for 10 minutes and stop there for 10 minutes. We used to go, okay, let's sit here and wait till it's 100%. We'd be sitting there for an hour, and then we'd still have to stop to top up off if we were going far enough. But if you do a couple of smaller charges, and you know what, it's probably good for you to get up, walk around, wake yourself up, grab a Coke, whatever, you know, input, output, get all that done and get back on the road. And, and you can do it in, in a, a short length of time with, yeah. uh, with doing it that way. Right. And that's not to say that all road trips require many frequent stops. For example, when we drive to Fresno, that's a four hour drive without stops. We, we end up making one stop and that's, that's fine. And it's not a long one. It can be as little as 20 minutes, if you want a little more charge when you arrive at your destination, maybe a little longer than that. But yeah, it's, actually, it's, I think 20 does it, but we take longer to eat a sandwich and go to the bathroom right. than it. <laughs> right. and, and we always stopped in Bakersfield for a sandwich yes. or something. You know, that's, We aren't doing anything different to do yeah. ours. I, I'm not one who can drive four hours without a stop. Yeah, there's a lot of people who claim to be able to do that. I did want to say one more thing about the uh, slowing the car down. Uh, Rod Simmons was our... Uh, is it Sensei? They are our mentor when we first got our our Teslas, and uh, he he likes to run it down to the wire. And he talked about yeah. driving to his mom's house, and it said uh, he was going you know seventy five miles an hour, and it said ooh, yeah, you know the car goes you're going to need to slow down a little bit because you're not going to make it. So he's like okay, I'll get down to sixty five, and it goes yeah, you're you're still going to be a little bit short. By the time he was rolling in, he was driving like thirty five miles an hour to make it into the end. I mean, he we, goes we in had, with four electrons left. Yeah. We had one incident like that. I don't know if you remember when we were coming back from Fresno, we were coming, I think it was, maybe maybe it was Vegas, uh, but we were coming through either Baker's, no, it wasn't Bakerfield, it was uh, Bishop. No. What is the... the I, I think we were coming big, back from Vegas. Yeah, the big yeah, thermometer the, one. <laughs> right, right. In any case, we did get that warning that you need to slow down to make your next destination. And I think I, I was able to get it just down to 55 and still make it. And I think it turned out to be okay because it was when we were going up the hill and then we were going to be going yes. down again. We were going over a little mountain range there and it turned out to be fine, but it was going, oof, I don't know if you're going to make this because it didn't know, I guess. For some reason, it didn't know we were going to go downhill and we were okay, but nothing like what Rod does. Rod's nuts. He's just, he pushes it to the edge. Yes, no doubt. All right. Well, I'm going to cut us off here. This is fun. Um, I enjoyed learning about this from you, and I think you enjoyed learning about it from uh, Motor Trend. Uh, like I said, the the images, Steve will have them uh, included in a blog post so you can look at them and to read the Motor Trend article. So uh, if people had questions for you, Steve, is there a way they can uh, get in contact with you? Yeah, I would say the three, well, two methods to contact me, would, which would be on Twitter at SP Sheridan or on Mastodon at spsheridan at astrodon.com. And then uh, you can follow me on YouTube at spsheridan or Steve Sheridan. And of course, oh, so you're, in our, you're in our Slack at podfeet.com slash Slack. You can talk there too. Of course too. I am. Everything good ends with podfeet. It starts with podfeet. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get it right. All right. It thanks. starts and ends. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming on, Steve. This was perfect. My pleasure. Until next time. Well, that is going to wind us up for this week. Did you know you can email me at allison at podfeet.com anytime you like? If you have a question or a suggestion, just send it on over. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeet at chaos.social. Remember, everything good starts with podfeet.com. If you want to join in the fun of the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash Slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocilla castaways. It's a lot of fun in there, and it's chatty, but not too chatty, you know, just the right amount of conversation. It's really, really fun. You can also support the show, as I mentioned earlier, by going to podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation at podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, which will be back next week, head on over to podfeet.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.